were popular in 74, 75, 76, they were on a decline. And then here comes these two individuals, Prince in particular, who basically created a new sound while also feeding off of the sound that was before him, right? And when 1980 came around, he basically created a new genre for himself. And that was the new wave funk period. And that was only for one album. Because then he would, you hey, know, guys, of course he would, it's this one exactly, here. Dirty Mind. I was living in the projects, exactly. 1125 Pierce Street, it's San Francisco. Exactly. Yeah, Dirty Mind. And this yeah, is what yeah, he did, yeah. you know what I mean? And he, he began to create movements for himself, and he basically began to do that with every album. He would create a new movement. And this was the beautiful thing about this brother, is that he never bit off of himself. He would always create something new so, to capture the public's imagination, and he always did. And you're talking about a rising star. I mean, he was the epitome of the guy who came from nothing and made nothing become something. He was the epitome of that, man. He was a rising star. And of course, later on in the mid eighties, he became the guy, the superstar, but he was rising and rising at this time. And there was no stopping that brother. No stop, his momentum was just unbelievable to capture at that time. It's crazy because during that time of the Dirty Mind time period, he actually played the Stone in San Francisco with the same exact stuff that he had on on the album cover, um, you know, trench coat um, for Dirty Mind. And actually, he did an in store at Rainbow Records on Market Street. And uh, it's just a trip looking back, Prince doing an in store. Um, it's just mind blowing. And that might be probably perhaps the last time that actually he was probably involved with something of that because. Like my man just said, he just ascended and ascended and ascended. And um, Dirty Mind, unlike anything that was on the radio, and at that time, you had some really strong, 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 not competition, but strong acts because Cameo had had Keep It Hot, which was huge, huge success. The Gap Band had Gap Band 3, which burned rubber was actually huge and um i'm trying to think y'all bro and people y'all bro and people it was a yeah it was a the jones girls had i just love yeah. that man and dance course, turned into zap romance zap yeah mm. but you think about prince prince which is kind of a metaphor for the way that i've always done soul school which was kind of just to do my own thing um head dirty mind uptown which i was completely crazy about was uh actually out on the radio and then actually he dropped the um what time is it project you know that's not you know side projects is a whole other show that's a whole nother show for prince but i think about when get it up first hit the radio man i was just like man this might be the funkiest piece that i've heard in a long long very long time and then all of a sudden cool and cool was crazy cool the long version the 10 minute and six second version of cool and just what he was playing was just it was insane man uh, basically, like I said before, he was creating a mini empire for himself. Not uh, probably not knowing he was doing that, he just needed an outlet to get his creative spark out. And the time came along, controversy came along, controversy. Vanity Six came along. <laughs> I mean, all of these things that were brewing inside of him, man. You know what I mean? Plus things that we heard later that he actually debuted back in '80, '80 '81. He wasn't able to get out until '86, '87. So. You're talking about a monster, monster period of time. And also producing for greats like Stevie Nicks, producing for greats like Sheena East. I mean, he was doing all of these things during this time period. He was only five, six years in the business at this time. And he already had the respect of the industry and industry veterans. This gives you a glimpse into the genius that is still among us. You know what I mean? Let's keep this chronologically going, which you've done. Rick had street songs out, which was crazy. Rick James was, 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 was really out of his mind, off the hook at that time, as far as really having some of the greatest product that we've ever, ever, ever heard. But Prince was always like really right there, which was kind of like, you could never really say that Rick at that time was actually better and Rick was on top of his game. You just get the feeling that Rick James always felt during that time when he was doing street songs that he was like perhaps nobody making music like him but prince had that same attitude to me prince james brown was an attitude i would say prince is a vibe you know just it's just just a cold different kind of vibe 
And when we get to the next LP, let me see if I can find it, because I got like three or four copies of all those albums. This one here. This one, anybody who knows me who's watched Soul School, I did a whole album review on this baby. This is my favorite, favorite Prince album of a many of favorites that I have. In uh, 1999, man, whether it's dance music, sex romance, 1999, Little Red Corvette, um, Let's Pretend We're Married, which is an unsung name, and the all, all-time funk game. I mean, just Lady Cab Driver, just his use of the Lynn drum machine. Um, utilizing different people like Des Dickerson and Lisa Coleman and you know he had got rid of Gail Chapman from his band where she actually um, quit and just everybody that he would bring in even though he was doing I would say probably about 95% of the stuff on his own but he still was utilizing other different talents and uh, let me let you have this one a little bit man. Yeah well 1999 I remember that time period very well that was a magical time in music period but this album right here kind of set the stage for what was going to be happening for the next two or three years in music because not it wasn't just the artistry of the music, it was the whole package, it was the look, it was the attitude that everyone began to copy. You know what I mean? Thriller around this time was magnanimous success, but everybody wanted to look and sound and act and be influenced by Prince. And this was the album that really set that bar, you know what I'm saying? Because you're talking about late 82, but it really didn't pick up until 83. And when it really began to pick up, yeah. it was yeah. it was the album to have. And you're talking about all the variety of music on this album, from International Lover to, as, as he mentioned, uh, dance music, sex romance, which was just a straight funk jam, to um, Let's Pretend We're Married, which was... You can't even categorize what kind of song that was. It was, yeah, just it was music, a double album you know set too, you know, just exactly. to kind of throw it out there. It wasn't just a single, it was a double album exactly. of just some of the baddest material that and was actually And the record company out. was adamant that they would not produce a double album on this brother because they didn't think it was sad. And it wound up being one of the best sellers in the history of music over time. So this was the album that set up what was going to happen next. This was the album, real quick, and let's get to some entertainment because I definitely want to keep the music going. This was the album that I've always felt should have got the movie, man. A quick thought before we get to the, the videos. About 1999. Yeah. Let's get to the videos, bro. Welcome back to Soul School. We just got through talking about the 1999 LP, which would ultimately set up this one. Now, this is the one that, um, I would say it changed everything, not for who he was, because he was always who he was as an artist, being perhaps the most complete artist of that time period. And uh, it's one of those things, um, and I'm being real serious here about this. Michael Jackson, generally, who I love and mean absolutely no disrespect to, so please don't take it that way, Michael Jackson fans, but he gets touted as the artist of the 80s, and uh, for my money, and this is not a personal opinion, I'm just being factual on this, when you look at, and we haven't even got to like the second half of the 80s with Prince's work, but without question, even without the side acts, which we're not going to talk about, Prince was clearly the artist of the 80s, and um, you know, I'm happy for Michael's success, and, and it, it really became full circle with Thriller. I had seen that scene before I, I lived it, and so I feel like I'm a bit qualified to talk about it. I was there from the beginning with Michael, and then I saw it all come full circle, as, as things always do. But with Prince, being first time around and then being involved with that time period, much like Madonna and just, you know, different people who have been there for a long time, I thought clearly, when, when you go album by album, and we haven't even got to like Parade and, and then Love Sexy and that stuff yet, that he was clearly, clearly the artist of the 80s, period. And, you know, whether he ever gets acknowledged for that part of it, um, for that part of the movement is, is totally immaterial to me. Um, I'm just, just, this is personal for me. And like I say, you guys know, how I feel about music, it is me. Music is my girlfriend, that's why I don't have one right now. Nobody else is gonna put up with that, you know. <laughs> Hopefully that may change, but Prince, getting back to that, he was, was <laughs> nobody else. I, I, I mean, just to me, he was really, really, I, I, I was really intrinsically involved with really loving music on, on a hardcore level. And to me, artists of the decade, not, not Michael Prince. You know, I'm just being real, I'm just being real. 
Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I agree with you 100%. Um, I believe that Prince is the artist of all time, but definitely the artist of the 80s, no doubt about it. I definitely agree with you there, man. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Purple Rain real quick and let's get to some entertainment. Um, Purple Rain, I was a six-year-old child, man, when Purple Rain came out in uh, 1984. I went to see it six times that year. Um, what, what theater did you go to? I'm just curious. Of course, the first one I went to was the St. Francis. Oh, okay. We that's, probably maybe at the same show because that's where I went, that's man. That's where all of us San Francisco kids with no money went. And uh, we, you know, handled that business there. But uh, as a complete experience, man, it was still something that I will never forget, even though I was only six years old. When I, be when I was able to experience Prince on the big screen, it still affects me today. You know what I mean? This is the movie that made me just fall in love with this thing, you know what I mean, called music, you know what I mean? Um, because this guy was, you know, just, the charisma popped off the screen. And he didn't say much in the movie, but the charisma on the stage presence, it popped off the screen. And that really affected me and influenced me as a six-year-old child, man. And uh, the album and everything, plus we uh, don't want to neglect to mention when we would flip those singles over with 17 Days and God and Erotic City, of course. He was, uh, once again, creating another movement. Man, 1984 was supposed to be the Jacksons year. Remember that. But that year belonged to Prince. You understand? And the movie came out during the second half of the year. He ran it, man. I mean, he ran it. And there was no question that the new kid in town was from Minneapolis, there was no question. I, you know, real quick, and I really want to keep it going with the music, but he's a cat that, it's hard, I could do, we, we could do a show with really no music and really just talk about this cat because uh, to me, I think the thing that blew my mind the most about that movie, and, and much like yourself, I saw it probably way more times than you did um, during that time period, was the score. I mean, just the way that it was scored in the movie, there was just different moments like, uh, when he tackled his father, when uh, he was, you know, they were in there arguing or whatever, and maybe he's, Dad, Mom! And then um, he popped Moms, and then Prince tackled him. There was some little subtle music that was going on in the background. I was just like, man, this dude is a genius. I mean, just little stuff like that. I've always, like, really, to me, I hadn't felt that since seeing, like, Curtis Mayfield score a sparkle. And the last time I felt it was actually Prince, and just, you know. Yeah, that was... Uh his genius during that time period, he, that was his baby, you know what I mean? So he was the initiator of that movie, you understand? So he took very good care of it. He handled business very well during that time. That was a magical time period. If anyone remembers that time period, the Purple Rain time period, I mean, he just made magic, man. He made magic and I still, of course, I still watch the movie to this day and still have the same feeling when I, my children love that movie, you understand? So. It's just uh, Prince is one of the blessings of life, bro. He is one of the blessings that we have, man. We should appreciate him while he's here. Let's get to it. His music from Prince from that Purple Rain time period, and we'll be back to give you a final thought. <laughs> 